Introduce yourself to the person sitting next to you if you don't know them already. Hi, I'm Dennis White, a Rotarian in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin in District 6220. This video is a demonstration of a presentation on culture shock and reverse culture shock. It's suitable for presentations as a model for inbound and outbound students, parents, and interested Rotarians. This video includes excerpts from a presentation on culture shock and reverse culture shock, as well as demonstrations of ways to make the presentation interactive. At the end of the presentation, viewers will be directed to other resources, including all of the PowerPoint slides that can be used to adapt for their own use. In a typical presentation, participants are formed into small groups where they have an opportunity to introduce themselves to one another. We try as often as possible to mix students, parents, and Rotarians, particularly getting them into groups where they don't know one another in advance. When a discussion question is presented to the large group, each small group is asked to discuss the question in their own small group. In this way, participation is greatly increased. In addition, small prizes are given as incentives to participate. Things like candy, youth exchange pens, and small inexpensive toys like chatty teeth and rubber chickens. It's amazing how small gifts can increase participation. Students and parents love getting toys and prizes. Following the presentation, participants who have themselves been exchange students or who have worked extensively with exchange students will give their personal experiences with culture shock and reverse culture shock. So, now, your first task, since you've met your new friend, is to help me with a definition. And every good definition gets a prize, okay? That's what they're there for. So, we talk about culture all the time, don't we? It's a word that's just thrown around in youth exchange all the time. But I want you and your group to come up with a good, simple definition of culture. So please tell me what culture is. Culture is the set of conscious and unconscious beliefs and behaviors that define a group of people. Culture is a personality of a group of people. A group of people, okay, all right. Uh, culture is a set of beliefs, traditions, and thoughts shared by a group of people. Okay, we're getting there, aren't we? Culture is the expression of the way of being of a people, their habits, history, and ultimately, their heart. Okay, all right. Okay, how'd you guys do? Pretty well, huh? I would have thought so. I mean, you're all youth exchange officers. Here's my definition. An integrated system. By that, it means inside the culture, it fits together. To an outsider, it may seem like random, crazy behavior. But within the culture, it makes sense. Learned behavior patterns. No one is born with culture. We learn how to stand, how to talk, how to eat, how to dress, etc. And they're characteristic of any given society or group. I like to get away from the concept of country. For example, if you're in Spain and you try to tell someone what Spain's like, good luck, because there's so many subcultures. Same thing in the United States. So it's any given group. It can be a family when we change from one host family to another. And it's everything, how people think, how they feel, and how they behave. So we know that we're in a different culture if we don't understand what they're saying, or if they dress differently, or they put some food in front of us and say, this is really good, and you don't recognize it. But we can't see how people think, and we can't see how they feel. That comes in the more subtle uh, manifestations of culture. So then if we talk about culture shock, we have to decide what that means. So once again, in your group, each Try to come up with a definition of culture shock. Okay, when you are in another culture and you're missing your own culture because it's different and, and you're stuck in another different way of living. That's and how is that shocking to people? What makes that shock? Well, it's, it's because you're missing your own culture. Okay, thank you very much. We'll put um, a nay and pen over for you and go to table two, over there. 
Um, we kind of talked about having clarity of different culture that's different from your own, which is really simple. Did you say clarity? Clarity, yes. Okay. Uh, actually, we'll, we'll build on that. Yeah, it's, it's a culture that's very different from your own. And it surprises you. Um, you're not expecting it to happen uh, because you maybe think that you're going somewhere very similar, but something rubs you differently. Something doesn't fit quite right and you're trying to figure it out. So confusion, the sadness, the realignment, the reorientation, sort of being outside what we refer to as outside your box. So here's my definition of culture shock. The profound sense of disorientation and discomfort that comes from extended travel or living in a culture that's markedly different from your own. The shock is I don't know what this means. I don't know what they're saying. I don't like this because I'm not comfortable. It's not uh, saying, oh, isn't it cute the way they do things over here. If you're, if you're in it, it just feels wrong. And it can lead to the most difficult stage of culture shock, which we'll come to in a, a minute. So metaphorically, culture is the lens through which we look at the world. If you imagine my glasses as sunglasses that are tinted green, everything I look at looks green. And then if I switch to pink sunglasses, the world just became pink. But I know in my head it didn't really change colors because I know where the lens is. But if the lens is in our heads, we don't necessarily know that. So Mark Twain said, you can't trust your eyes when your imagination is out of focus. What are you looking for? If you're looking through a lens that says culture and people behave this way and you go someplace else, the focus just isn't there. So I'm going to do a little test with you. This is a vision test that optometrists will give to test for color blindness. Someone tell me, what, what do you see? A bunch of circles in different shades of gray. Now, if you are colorblind, red, blue colorblind, this is what you'll see. If you have red, blue vision, I mean red, green, this is what you'll see. What do you see? Six. A six, a red six in a background of green. So color blind, color vision. Think of that as culture blind, culture vision. Oh, after three months, that's what my host mother meant when she got up every morning and greeted me. Now I see it. I mean, we say that metaphorically. So we'll see what uh, paying attention with a cultural lens can do to us sometimes. Most of you have seen this before. When we go to another culture and we don't understand what's going on and then someone says, they're, that's why they're doing it. Oh, the aha moment. Now I see it. That's what just happened in a, in a microcosm. Most people only see one or the other. There's an old woman and an, a young woman. How many people can see the old woman? Raise your hand. How many people can see the young woman? Raise your hand. Now here's the honesty test. How many of you cannot see an old woman? See, the people. there's some people who don't see it yet, right? How many cannot see the young woman? Okay, there's some people there. There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with your vision. But if someone is coaching you now, see what's going on around here? Pretty soon you'll hear someone say, oh, oh, aha, okay? The old woman is looking like this with a big nose and a chin sticking out. The young woman is looking over her shoulder like this and her jawline is like this and she has a necklace on, okay? So, if you see them both, great. If you don't, you will if you look at it long enough. Now, we've already talked about culture. We've talked about culture shock. What causes culture shock and what causes cultural differences is ethnocentrism. It's also a word that's used a lot, but people don't necessarily have a precise definition. So once again, will you please talk with your table mates about what ethnocentrism might be? We said it's something like our culture is the best culture and our maybe the only good and maybe culture. the only culture our culture is the best culture and maybe the only culture okay that our values are you know more important and kind of more right than another culture's values believing that our values are 
not only more important, but probably right as opposed to the other culture's values. Good. Our culture is right what we think is right, and it's better than yours, and yours is probably even wrong. Not just that we're better, you're wrong. The idea that a culture, uh, from your point of view, is better, correct, or more accurate than anyone else. Here's my definition of ethnocentrism. The universal, this is important, the universal tendency for any culture, all cultures, to see their own values and practices as natural and correct. Doesn't everybody do it that way? When we had a German uh, inbound in having dinner at our house and my children were like two, four, and six, we all know that Europeans use a knife and fork the correct way. And we Americans, if we use anything, it's a fork. And usually it's just our fingers, right? So, so here are my three children who are barely housebroken, and they're looking at Johan saying, boy, you eat funny. <laughs> you know, there's the pot calling the kettle black, right? So they're, they're eating with their fingers. But the point is they saw that as strange and different, and when we see strange and different, we usually think of it as wrong at first. All cultures have to be ethnocentric. Nobody is raised with a, an ethno-relative point of view, unless they're raised in a bicultural family or a bilingual family, then they have a whole different lens. But for most of us that grow up in one culture, we learn all the rules without them being on the refrigerator wall. You know, how, how, do, you, how do you ask for something? Uh, what's the best way to eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? My kids would go to their grandparents and my mother would cut the peanut butter and jelly sandwich diagonally, uh, instead of in rectangles, they were triangles, they wouldn't eat them. <laughs> Grandma doesn't know how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And the most common ethnocentric assumption is that we think we can literally translate from one language to another. And those of you who are bilingual or more know how untrue that is but still we try. I collect advertisements, signs in restaurants from around the world where people have tried to make an, an English expression and it's obvious that they're not native speakers of English. I'm not doing it to make fun of them, it's just that we all here speak English so we'll see the humor, but it, it works the other way just as well and I'll give you an example. Uh, in a dry cleaners in Bangkok, we saw a sign that said, drop your trousers here for best results. <laughs> Now, you probably know what that meant, but no native speaker of English would say it that way. What would we say? Leave your clothing here. We'll get really good results when we clean your clothes. Uh, this one in a cocktail lounge in Norway said, ladies are requested not to have children in the bar. <laughs> they did not mean that childbirth was prohibited, right? They meant, don't bring your kids. American films are often translated or subtitled. And so in Japan, the very first James Bond film, Dr. No was translated as, we don't want a doctor. <laughs> the Titanic in Japan, they, they have action creative titles for everything. How can you improve on Titanic to explain the film Titanic? Well, they did and they came up with the ship out of luck. <laughs> it actually makes more sense, doesn't it? In Mexico, this film was translated as The Rebel Novice Nun. What film was that? The Sound of Music, thank you. In the Czech Republic, it was translated as Santa is a Pervert. What's the movie? Bad Santa. In China, it was translated as one night, big belly. What's a, what's a colloquial phrase for becoming pregnant? Knocked up. The movie Knocked Up, yes, okay. And in Venezuela, it was translated as Vaselina. Grease, yes, okay, save the best for last. My favorite advertisement that was, was a mistake in translation was the Swedish manufacturer of vacuums. Electrolux. They came up with a new slogan which was, nothing sucks like Electrolux.
which is true, right? I mean, if they think it's a good product. This is from the film My Big Fat Greek Wedding, which if you haven't seen it, is a treasure trove of cultural and ethnocentric encounters. In this case, the brother uh, of the bride, the Greek bride, is um, talking with the, the groom. And he wants to thank the mother for giving him some food. So he says, how do you say thank you in Greek? And as many of you know who've been exchange students, your host brothers and sisters will tell you dirty phrases <laughs> that, that they think is really funny when you say it. So let's see if, if this happens. Not being weird. Yes, you are. You're weird when you're pregnant with <sighs> Ooh, ah, 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 ah. Ian, eat, eat. How do you say thank you in Greek? Orea visia. Orea visia. That's it, you got it. Orea visia. I was in the American Peace Corps in Iran and I taught English at all grade levels. And the littler the kids were, the more they knew that I didn't speak Farsi very well. So they would do this to me all the time. Or they would ask me a question and they knew if I didn't understand it, I would just smile and say yes. So they asked me some really obscene questions and I'd just say yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so this one is where uh, it's not so much understanding the language as pronunciation. Das hier ist mein Sektor. Das hier ist das wichtigste Gerät des Küstenwächters. Das Gerät und das Gerät. Überlebensradar. Mayday, Mayday. Hello, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you... Okay, over. We are sinking. We are sinking. Hello? This is the German Coast Guard. What are you thinking about? That's a ship out of luck. In a new culture, everything is harder. Everything is harder. And our own culture, or subculture, comes to us as naturally as, and, and unconsciously as handedness. So if you're right-handed, you don't get up in the morning and decide which hand you're going to use to brush your teeth. You go with your dominant hand. And if you break your right hand and it's in a cast and you go to brush your teeth, you will probably still start to pick up the toothbrush with a hand in a cast. And then you go, oh, yeah, and you switch over because we know we have to do it a different way. But when you're in a culture where you're trying to learn all these things that are different, it's like your whole body's in a cast and you can't get out of it to do what you need to do. So changing, changing our cultural point of view and changing cultural behavior is about as hard as changing handedness. We can do it, but it's not easy. So I need a volunteer. I need someone to come up here. <laughs> and she happens to be from one of my favorite countries, Brazil, right? Okay, so we're going to talk, all right? No, 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 don't go away. So <laughs> if, we're, if we were in a conversation with just the two of us in the room, we would probably be standing like this, which just happens to be the distance it takes to put my finger in her ear. Don't get close. Don't go Brazilian on me. Come on. <laughs> so where does that rule come from? We learn it through our behavior. Now I'm going to come in. I'm going to come in. Pretend you're an American now, okay? Oh, okay. I'm going to come in six inches closer. Look what she did. She went back. And what? How far did she go? How did you know to do that? You lived in the United States, right? Part of America. Okay. Now I'm going to step back six inches. You need to be Brazilian. It'd be anything you want. It's too far. <laughs> <laughs> It's too far away, right? Now, let's take an American and a Brazilian, and we can dance around, right? OK? We, we, it's a dance. Yeah? But I'm going to come from Thailand, OK? And she's going to be all over me, right? She's going to hug me, and I'm going to get away. <laughs> Why do they do that? Because they're Brazilian. Why does the guy from Thailand move away? Because he's a Thai. 
That's that handedness thing we were talking about. All right, this deserves a chicken, I think. Right? <laughs> so if you think of culture as an iceberg floating in the sea, seven-eighths of the iceberg is below the surface. Only one-eighth shows up. That's what got the Titanic, right? So the things that are above the surface that are conscious, we know it's a different language if we don't understand it. We know it's different food if it crawls across the, the table on us or it comes out of a bowl and has eyes staring at us. But the part that's below that is where our values and beliefs are, which you can't see directly. They come indirectly. So what happens in the United States, because we're such an individualistic society, is that well-meaning youth exchange officers will advise their student, well, you can't possibly know everything about that culture, so just be yourself. Huh. Really? And I tell them, if you do that, consider the new culture to be an iceberg, and you are the Titanic, right? Because you will get in trouble. I can't do what comes naturally. I want to do what is appropriate in that culture. And that's hard to do. And even if I know how to do it, it I get very uncomfortable until I've done it enough times to feel good about it. So I need another volunteer. And this time I need a man. Martine, is that right? Yes. Oh, when I went into the Peace Corps in Iran, I learned the language and I learned a lot of things about the culture. One thing they forgot to tell us is that as a sign of friendship, Men walk down the street like this. That's what we normally do in Mexico. Well, <laughs> we're not in Mexico. We're in the United States, right? No. So, so the first time I saw that, what was my ethnocentric conclusion? Yeah. There are a There's a whole bunch of gay men in Iran because they were all doing it. So I wasn't, I wasn't homophobic. It was just like, oh, that's what that means. That was my lens. So I went to my little village. So I, now I've got it intellectually, right? That's, I understand my hand's broken. I've got to use my left hand. But emotionally and behaviorally, the first time I'm walking down the street with my friends, you grab my hand. I did this. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? And then I, OK, Dennis, this is what they do, right? OK. So we walked down the street. Now, in this little village, there was no electricity. There were no restaurants. There was not much to do but walk up and down the street you know, unpaved street, it called it gardeshing. It's like promenading, okay? Like teenagers do in the United States when they cruise Main Street in their cars. This was an every night occurrence. So I got better and better, go ahead. I got better and better, it was fine. But then they realized I was never taking the initiative, approaching them. It's like, what's, what's with this guy? So, okay, I'll do it. And I did, and after two years, I was really good at it, and I didn't think about it. I did not think about it. And then when I came home, <laughs> I realized that I'd better think about it. Because my friend, when I even started to get close to a male friend, they, they just, they're ready to sock me, you know. What are you doing? And I tried to explain, and then it just got really crazy. Oh, wait, yeah. <laughs> okay. So anybody that lets me do that to them gets a chicken, right? Thank you. Oh. Students are supposed to send us messages every week, every month, some, some periodic time. And when I first got in Youth Exchange, this was actually a handwritten report that got mailed in the snail mail way. But I remember one of the first ones I saw, the student said after about two months, culture shock takes me outside my comfort zone. Well, no kidding. That's the whole point, isn't it? If it's comfortable, then it's not a shock. If, if it feels natural, you are probably already in that culture. I just gave you a couple of examples. Social distance, what's comfortable, and holding hands. Those are both things that were outside my comfort zone when I went to different cultures. So remember, culture shock is that profound sense of discomfort. I don't like this. It's not, doesn't feel natural and disorientation, what, what's going on here, that comes from this extended experience. And we know that there are four predictable stages of culture shock. They don't happen the same way for everybody, 
but there's almost always a period of initial excitement. For your outbound candidates now, they're already in it. They haven't even gone where they're going, but they're excited. They're learning about the culture. Then they hit the wall when they get there and they realize, holy cow, these people are going to be like this all the time. Um, girl who went to China in a group, and after about three weeks, a person like me was processing and said, so how are you liking it here in China? And this girl said, I love it. I got to go to Tiananmen Square. My host families have been so nice to me. I, I got to see the Great Wall. And then she had this kind of far off look in her eyes. And she said, but you know, over here, they eat Chinese food every day. <laughs> and she wasn't trying to be smart or, or, or sarcastic. She could have said, I really miss Big Macs or something like that. But the point was, Chinese food in China is not ethnic food. It's food, right? So that was that irritability stage. And when people get to that stage, they don't say, gosh, I think I'm in the irritability stage of culture shock. They say, I don't like this. I think I picked the wrong country. I'm in the wrong place. Something went wrong here. But then if they stick with it, there's this long period of gradual adaptation, usually bound in language acquisition, and then finally, integration or ability to be in both cultures, to be maybe a, a six-foot, blonde, blue-eyed uh, white guy who's in, in uh, Japan is never going to look like a native, right? But he can act like it. He can learn the culture. So the typical stage of culture shock can be depicted in this diagram. You've got the months of the year, and you have a normal level of feeling going straight across, and then you have the emotional course of a year of exchange. Stages one, one is the, that first peak, two is the irritability stage where people dive down, three is a long, slow adaptation stage, and four is being culturally competent, or competent enough to survive in the culture. And then look what happens. The, t the highest point, what month is that? Uh, 10 months. That's when you got to go home. And that's why rebound students, or outbound students who are going to become rebound say, no, it's not fair. I c you can't make me come home now. Of course, we know we can, right? But, but the, the emotion, the sentiment is, it, this is just getting good. So when they come off the plane, they're not necessarily happy campers. They're, they were excited to go abroad. They may not be excited to come home. I wasn't ready for this. So look at the four stages depicted here. And we are going to be a human culture shock cycle at this point, OK? I've got some swimming noodles here. And we're going to recreate this chart. And the first stage, that's it, is excitement. So what would we see when someone is in that first stage? What kind of behavior does a student engage in when they're in the excitement stage? What do we see? What did you do? Everything's good. Everything's good. Come up, Terry. Come on, come on, quick. Oh, everything's great. <laughs> <laughs> that's good, that's good. All right, what else would we see or hear? Trying what all the food. Trying everything. Come on up. Get, get another one, Terry, Terry. Uh, what, hi? Terry. You gotta go like this. Oh, what do I have to do? Don't move it, just okay. stand there, okay? That's what she said. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Drake says? Trying all the food. Trying all the food at least once. I tell students that too. You can always throw up later. You don't have to worry about it. Just try it, just try it, okay? What else would you see? What else would you, what would people be doing in that first stage? Yeah, they're tourists, right? Yeah. I'm uh, taking pictures, I'm sending them back home, going everywhere. All right, you get right behind, right next to Drake. Now you guys have to get real chummy. Get close to one another. All right, we're still going up. But you hit the wall eventually. What do we know happens to students when they hit that wall and they get into that irritability stage? What do we hear as, as uh, YEOs? Oh, don't like I don't like this place. What else? I miss my friends, I miss my family. What else? That's not for me. This is not for me. What do you say? Well, you, I'm, I mi missing my family. I miss my family, I miss my, my friends. friends, okay. What's the worst thing that people do in the 
irritability stage of culture shock? Isolate. They isolate. Who said that? Yeah. Come on up. They withdraw. They spend all their time in their room. They're online all the time. Come, come on over closer to her. Get, get together, guys. Yep. Come on. All right, now we hit that long, slow adaptation phase. What has to happen? What do we see when we know the student is starting to learn the culture? Language, language. language acquisition. And what is the, one of the most interesting things that students tell us when they're getting the language? <laughs> I'm dreaming in Portuguese. I'm dreaming in German. So who said that first? Come on up, Roberta. What else? What else happens in that long, slow adaptation phase? They make friends, and they do stuff. It doesn't have to be a perfect chart, right? What, what's something else a person would do when they're, when they're trying to adapt? How, how would we know that they're doing that? Come on up here. If they're having problems, they solve their problems where they are. They use their YEO. They use their host parents. They don't call back to wherever they came from. They're still going to have problems, right? But they're going to solve their problems where they are, OK? Yeah. Now, no, that's good. <laughs> Actually, we've got to bring that down just a little bit. It'll come up in a minute. And, and uh, the last stage is actual cultural competence. Now, when someone says, I've been dreaming in German, then that means they're getting the language. What are they going to do when they really have finally arrived? They're, they're not, they're not German, but they feel comfortable in German culture. What do we see? What do we hear from them? I'm doing it without thinking about it. What else do we see? Remember what month of the year is? I'm not going home. You can't make me go home. Somebody come up and be that person. I want to stay here. If you all remember what your phrases were, we're going to go through a quickie course in culture shock, starting with Terry. Woo, everything's great. It's so amazing here. I want to try all the food. I want to visit everywhere. This is not for me. I'm starving this in my family and my people. I don't want to talk to anyone. I speak the language. I'm thinking of Portuguese. I've made friends. I haven't talked to my friends or parents for months. <laughs> 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 Wait, wait, again, so we hear you. I don't think or talk in my own language. I don't even think or talk in my own language. I want to stay here. I'm going to stay here. <laughs> or this, this I, I don't even think or talk in my own language. When I do talk to my parents, I start talking in the language in, the, in my host country. And they say, what are you talking about? And I say, well, I can't really translate it. Because they've learned idiomatic expressions. Mm -hmm. OK. so. When I do this with students, we go through it several times. Now, if I stood up at a lectern and said, the first stage of culture shock is excitement and lots of taking pictures, and then I go through it three or four times, I've lost them. But they're the ones that are doing it. So they understand there are these stages. Now, this is pretty good, because look at this stage. Look how high that is. This was high. This was a lot of fun. But that's tourism, isn't it? This is cultural competence. This is mastery. This is a, an inner sense of accomplishment. And as we know, you can't buy that. It has to happen. And that's why when we can get them to talk about it, our rebound students can just open up a world of awareness for us and for them. The irritability stage is so difficult for some students. They want to regain that high, this high, of, it was so nice when I was, it was all new and fresh. And they never go through the wall. They don't get through that barrier, the red line. So they get in a kind of a vicious cycle. And they'll turn to other inbounds, because it's easy to make friends with other inbounds, right? Not so much with your host brother or your host sister. But if they can do it, they get through that stage, and they go to that gradual adaptation stage. They go through a real enculturation. These are all synonyms for getting immersed in a culture. Acculturation, immersion, assimilation, adaptation, it all means the same thing. You are getting outside yourself and learning to do something a totally different way. And that integration stage, 
we talked about you don't have to think about it first. You don't have to translate in your head. Um, you can go do things uh, without thinking about it. If they eat with their fingers in India, you just eat with your fingers in India. If they use a knife and fork, or if they do it the European way, it's not right, not wrong, just different. And we also hear a lot about why it's not fair that we make them come back. So I talked about that second high, that's the dotted line. That is cultural competence. It beats the heck out of tourism. Now, most people anticipate some degree of culture shock. A lot of outbounds don't believe it'll happen to them. But very few people will accept that they might experience reverse culture shock. But I've set up the stage for that. Because they adapted so well, that's why when they come home, they have a tough time. It's the often unexpected discomfort coming back to your own culture. So I'm going to say that it's the same four stages, but the initial stage may be very short or it may not happen at all. And the second stage can be very long because, wait a minute, I came back to Canada. Why should I have to adapt to Canadians? I'm a Canadian. What's wrong with these people? They didn't change. You changed. So you remember that culture shock cycle we showed here? The next one is a yellow depiction of what happens sometimes in returning home. There's a very brief period of excitement. I get to do everything once for the first time, see my friends, pet spot the dog, and then it's like, OK, I did it. Now I want to go back home. Where? I want to go home. Home is not in the United States or Canada. It's where they've been for the last nine or 10 months. And moms and dads, when you hear that, it's like, what? You are home. I miss my mom. I'm your mom. So they're in a crazy world there. This is a return that is uh, no initial excitement at all. You go to, to the airport to pick up your son or daughter. They go through security. They come out. You've got balloons and signs, welcome home, Becky. And the first thing she says is, I'm going back. <laughs> Thank you for, for being so nice and, and telling us how glad you are to see us. Because what they've been doing on the plane all the way back is figuring out how they're going to get back. They've already got it planned out, no matter how unrealistic it might be. So you remember that initial metaphor for culture shock? You see things more than one way. But when people see that, it's like, oh, I've never seen this before. I have to figure it out. But the metaphor for coming home is looking at something that you've seen every day of your life, like this. And someone says, have you seen the arrow in the FedEx logo? What arrow? There's an arrow in that. So <laughs> there it is. Now you've seen it. That's right. Now you cannot not see it. And that's the point. When, you, when someone comes home and they see these things and they think, wow, has it always been this way? The answer is, yeah. What's different? You. I spent two years in Iran when I go to the market, an open air market, and I wanted some meat. I would point to this big hunk of lamb on the hanging from a hook, and I'd say, I want a kilo of that. They'd whack it off. They would put it in a newspaper and put it in my plastic bag that I took home. When I got back to the United States, I went to Kroger. The piece of meat is in a plastic wrapper. And then when I go to the checkout counter, they put that in a plastic bag. And then they put that in a paper bag. And I'm just standing there like, what's wrong with you people? You people, right. I was an outsider in my own culture. And just one little example. So for rebound students, it's often like a, a, a variation on the Wizard of Oz. We've all seen the Wizard of Oz, right? We know the old version, Judy Garland. What does she do all through the movie? I want to go home. I want to go home. You know, she's like a really bad exchange student, right? <laughs> I want to go home. So this cartoon tells uh, Dorothy what happens when you do come home. Jeez, we're back in Kansas, Toto. I don't think I like this after all. I just left all that color and, and excitement, and it's just plain, flat Kansas. 
She liked it when she was there originally, but after a while in Oz, maybe she'd like to go back to Oz. Anyway, culture shock and reverse culture shock, shock are not unpleasant side effects of an exchange. They're the essential components. They're necessary to bring about the quality of intercultural education. And I don't mean academic education, I mean learning the culture. Following the presentation, participants who have themselves been exchange students or who have worked extensively with exchange students will give their personal experiences with culture shock and reverse culture shock. For me, I didn't want to go to the exchange, so U.S. was completely not for me when I first got here, and I felt everything and then I didn't want to go back home to Brazil. I was an exchange student to Liège, Belgium in 1985-86. I exchanged for all of the wrong reasons. I had a really dysfunctional and honestly abusive family that I was trying to flee. And Rotary Youth Exchange was an opportunity to no longer live at home for a period of time. I didn't really have much of a desire to learn another language, learn another culture. I just wanted to be somewhere else. and. Um, it was transformative, and I wish I had had the sort of training because I didn't appreciate how hard it would be to leave because it was, again, a unique situation that I'd be coming back into something that was not only culturally different but also personally uncomfortable. I didn't know there was a science of uh, the cultural shock, but I could exactly relate all my exchange uh, year to these stages of the cultural shock. Every one of them I had, even the, the re-shock when I came back. I experienced all of the culture shock waves that they say. Um, I remember getting to Switzerland, arrived in the morning, and said yes to going hiking that afternoon, <laughs> um, which as you can imagine was a lot. Um, a few weeks later I got really homesick and the best thing that I ever decided to do was actually cut contact with everyone at home. My shock was that I always take three showers a day and then there they didn't know why I'm going to take a shower. My sister came one day and said, Roberta, do you have any problem in your skin that has to take shower? I said, no. Okay, here we just take an one shower per day. That was, for me, a very shock. Rotarians, we should be more prepared to be good counselors and to deal with both sizes, with the parents' cultural shock, the host families, and the exchange students too. That's my opinion. I was raised in a household where my mother would say, okay, it's 9 p.m., you have school tomorrow, you have to get up at 6.30 a.m., so go to bed at around 9 or 10. In Argentina, they eat dinner at 9 p.m. Um, so uh, my host family, my host brother was a guitarist, and he would stay awake until like 2 a.m. playing his guitar, and my host mother and my host sister would stay up and chat very loudly, and I was not used to that, so I was like, when do I sleep? The students that come back, especially if they have lived in a different social economic state. When they come back to little rural Saskatchewan and they're used to having a driver, a gardener, a maid, a cook, not even having a key to the house because the butler lets them in at any time, they have a hard time when mom says, okay, go do the dishes. Well, I don't do dishes anymore. When I came back from Korea, well, I was very sad. I was one of those students that was crying on the plane the whole time. I didn't want to go home. And then when I came back, I found myself um, bowing to people in the grocery store when I saying thank you in Korean, which I was used to. They say, come on me and they just bow their head. Um, I felt like I couldn't relate to any of my peers, my friends. Um, I felt like I'd been through this super extraordinary experience and no one really understood how I was feeling. Um, I think the biggest thing is is that when we look at culture shock and reverse culture shock it will have certain patterns but it's not the same for everyone and we have to treat each student uniquely taking in not only where they're from um, and our perceived ideas of the culture that they come from but also what they've experienced before they've come today when we have Facebook zoom internet messenger it's so much harder to help them go through the curve than it was 
in my time. I wrote a letter, airmail, it took two weeks, <laughs> and another one came back, it was a month in between, and then things could, you know, emotionally, many things could happen during four weeks, but now it's instantaneous. We go through this culture shock training with the students, and it's made a massive difference because now they, uh, they understand that the culture shock is coming because it comes for all of them, and that when it comes, go dark again, stop calling home, instead get out of the house, get off your phone, just talk to friends, talk to your school, do chores, anything to be active, and it's been massively helpful, and then kind of even doing the same thing when you get back home with reverse culture shock. The PowerPoint slides and written articles about culture shock and reverse culture shock can be found at nayan.org under YEO Resources. This video and all related materials are free and available to anyone working in youth exchange activities. Viewers are encouraged to adapt these materials and develop a presentation that they're comfortable with. Good luck as you attempt to make a good presentation on culture shock and reverse culture shock.